لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين رحمة للعالمين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المظلومين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا أما بعد فقد قال الحكيم في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة صلوا على محمد وآل محمد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Indeed it is the blessings of Abba Abdullah al-Hussein that we have now reached a lot closer to the day of Ashura and it has been almost a week now that we've been gathering together it's our seventh night and lo and behold very soon the day of Ashura will be upon us and we will be no longer in the presence of Abba Abdullah but we'll be mourning Lady Zainab and the, the people of the caravan Brothers and sisters, these days will pass by very quickly and we will feel the emptiness when they are gone. This opportunity has come to us and it is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Mawla Amir al-Mu'mineen keeps reminding us that Al-Furasu Tamurru Marra Sahab Opportunities come and pass by just like the passing of the clouds. This opportunity of the days of Muharram, especially the first 10 nights, is a very fine opportunity for us to not only connect with Abba Abdullah al Hussein through our emotions, through our feelings, through our recognizing of the tragedy, but also to elevate ourselves spiritually because connecting to Abba Abdullah is nothing but getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the door towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we find in these nights that we've been given this opportunity to discuss ways that we can not only in speech become closer to Abba Abdullah, let's also become closer to Abba Abdullah in our thought. And as a result, become closer to him in our actions as well. We've been discussing some issues in the past few nights regarding shifting our paradigms towards aligning them with Abba Abdullah al-Hussein, towards moving to a Husseini paradigm. And over the past two nights, I've had the opportunity to move a bit more into the practical dimension of applying what it means to be a Husseini. Two nights ago, we discussed about haram food, and haram means or what makes our bellies filled with haram. And Alhamdulillah, I got some feedback. Yesterday, I talked about certain challenges again that we as a community, and especially our youths, are facing in today's society. And I got some feedback as well. And I appreciate both encouraging feedback and constructive feedback that was passed on to me. 
And I understand that there is some sensitivity about talking about these issues. And knowing about the need to talk about these issues, I decided to actually touch upon these issues. On one hand, Mola is telling me he rose to bring islah. islah fi ummati jaddi, to bring reform. And on one hand, I have this urge to remind myself and my brothers and sisters about areas where we need islah in the community and in our lives personally. Brothers and sisters, there is one aspect of islah that is very important. We need to know where the problems are. And right now, setting aside whatever was said yesterday, and it might not have been, it might not have been quite settling for people, it might have been unsettling yesterday, but I urge you to please go into the high schools today in Edmonton or in whatever place and find out what goes on and what is taught and what is the culture in the high schools in the public system right now. And inshallah in that retrospect, yesterday's discussion will make inshallah a lot more sense. Today's discussion emanates from this verse of the Holy Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse reminds us as believers, He says, anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Save yourselves and your families from the fire of hell. Waquduhan nasu al hijara. The fuel of that fire is people and stones. Now that fire of the hereafter that is awaiting for those who are suitable to enter into it, they become eligible to enter into that fire here, not there. They do something here in this life that they become eligible to not go into Jannah, rather go into Jahannam, into the hellfire, right? We've been talking about these issues and our focus, if it is on the hereafter, we will make sure we nurture our souls so that we are leading ourselves towards Jannah. But if our focus is, on, is not on the hereafter, we'll be focused on nurturing our bodies and our material needs only and that will lead us to the hellfire, unfortunately. In this context, we break one other paradigm of the society that we live in. This society is based on individualism. And it says you are responsible for yourself and that's it. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Right? Isn't that what it is? Yeah. Here, the whole idea of interacting or helping others better their lives becomes out of the picture. I have no authority, no right, no responsibility towards anybody else based on the rules of the society that we live in. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says no. Rather, not only you have a responsibility towards everybody in society, al-mu'minuna wal-mu'minat, ba'aduhum awliya'u ba'ad ya'muruna bil-ma'aruf wa yanhawna anil munkar, Mu'mineen and Mu'minat have a responsibility to each other. That's on one side. Inshallah, we'll talk about that later in one of the nights. But Allah says specifically, save yourselves and your families. Not only yourselves. What does that mean? Me and my family. Who is my family? Not only it is my wife and my children and my children specifically. But everybody who you can call a family. Related by blood or by marriage, or through other means. Right? But primarily if we zoom in to our own nuclear families, I as a father or a sister as a mother has a responsibility to not only save herself or himself from the fire of hell, but to save their whole family from the fire of hell. Now, this is a responsibility that Allah has given us. What do we do about it? One option is to take it as it comes from religion. As Imam al-Hussein has reminded us, 
When trials and tribulations come, those people who think in a religious way become few. We are in a situation where there is bala, where there, where there is trial around us. Now, yesterday we talked about marriage and the challenges that come about in marriage. My dear brothers and sisters, the reason I bring these discussions is a lot of the issues in society trace their roots back to marriage and the family unit. One of the greatest unfortunate happenings in this society is that the family unit is not strong. And this is my personal advice from the Holy Quran to the ones who are leaders in governing this society. Where at whatever level it might be, please strengthen the family, the society's problems will become less. The situation in society will become better. Now on one hand, let me go through a list. There's a whole list that I have of problems that go back to the society. Number one, on one hand, there are a lot of physical issues. As a teacher, as an educator, I can tell you. When we work with kids with special needs, if you go back into the roots of many of these special needs, it goes back to either genetic factors or acts that parents have done at the time before the child is born. And as a result of those actions, the child is now suffering. They are, have limited ability to understand and limited ability to feel success. Why? Because parents did something. For example, there is a syndrome that is to do with the mother consuming alcohol while she's pregnant. And the child in, their, in his development or her development as a fetus goes through a phase where they cannot process these things because of the effect of the alcohol. Well, parents are responsible here. Parents have a hand in here in the future of the children. But on the other hand, if we look at some of the mental health issues, and I went to this workshop organized by, um, in our local authority, we have the BC Fraser Health Authority, which is sort of the, the primary health uh, caregiver in the province of British Columbia. They actually held a workshop specifically for imams and uh, scholars of the Muslim community. So I was invited and I went. And the topic was mental health and abuse. And how to cope with it, how to help people who go through mental health issues. What do we mean by mental health? Basically people who have gone through difficulties in life and as a result they have turned to, because of depression, because of other issues, have turned to drugs or other ways to either minimize the impact it has on their normal life or to forget the past or the suffering that they're going through in simple long story short the conclusion of or the main idea that was presented to us was this that people have issues with mental health because they feel suffering they're going through suffering. And what is the suffering? Why does the suffering come into place to begin with? Where does it start from? And they said, out of the research that they had in their hands, the main cause of suffering was a feeling that they do not feel belonging anywhere. They don't feel belonging anywhere. When a person does not feel a sense of belonging, they become detached and the more they disconnect and detach once from the community once from friends once from workplace once from from all places of a person who's detached there's one last place that they're always attached to and that is the family worst come even if they're detached from their siblings there's one person or two if they're both alive inshallah their parents Parents will never let go of children. Emotionally, they're always connected. Parents are always a refuge for the children. Well, if a person does not have parents to attach to, if, a, if the person does not have a community to support them, if a person does not have a positive peer group to interact with, where will they go? 
what will they feel? They will undergo suffering. And as a result to alleviate, or not to alleviate rather, this suffering cannot be alleviated through drugs and through alcohol abuse. Rather, it becomes worse because of drugs and alcohol. And it is a reality, my dear brothers and sisters. It's happening across Canada, across North America, in our Muslim communities. I am not mincing words here. You say alcohol, haram, haram. You say drugs, haram, haram, true. But it is happening. What do we do about it? One option is to say, you are involved in alcohol, I don't want to see your face anymore. You involved in drugs, I don't want to see your face anymore. What happens now? You're increasing their suffering. What do we do then? Bar them from the masjid? No. Rather, we as a community need to realize the very first and foremost place that we need to start building that support base. True, we're not discounting the fact that haram is taking place. We're not. Keeping that in mind that haram is happening, we need to work and do nahi anil munkar. This is nahi anil munkar. When you take a person and say, yes, what you're doing is bad, is, is a vice, is evil. But you as a person have faith in yourself. That is the most precious thing you have. Brothers and sisters, based on this most precious thing, you stand by the mayyit and you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma inna la na'lamu minhu illa khaira. It is because of this faith that they have with Allah and with the Ahlul Bayt It's because of this that you stand by a person that you know they've committed evil, but you still come to their mayyit, to their janazah, to their funeral and you say, Oh Allah, I bear witness that I do not know anything but goodness from this person. And it is part of namaz mayyad it's a wajib part, right? Aren't we saying this? Because we believe that there is a goodness in every mu'min, and that is their iman. Using their iman in a positive way, we would like to bring them out of their suffering, out of the evil that they have put themselves in, because of their own actions or because of the environmental influences and we want to bring them out of it. This is Nahi Anil Munka. This is Amra Bil Ma'roof, my dear brothers and sisters. This is where a community stands the litmus test of being a mu'min community. How well can we help people, the most vulnerable people? It's easy to work with people who come to the masjid every day or every Thursday night. It's easy. Because you see them. It's more difficult to work with people who don't even come to the masjid. And realizing the fact that they're not coming because they have some issues. We need to go after them, bring them inshaAllah ta'ala. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, and it all goes back to the family. Each family needs to strengthen itself first and foremost before the rest of the community comes in. The community is there to support, but each family needs to look within and say, and observe and do a hisab and do a muhasaba and audit itself and see, are we as a family lacking somewhere vis-a-vis -vis the expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Brothers and sisters, children are not only our offspring. But in the words of the Qur'an, they are a means for our own betterment. Rather, they are our continuation into eternity. They are not just a biological part of ourselves. They are a spiritual part. Rather, they are a continuation of our spiritual legacy. Proof. In the Holy Qur'an, there's a verse that's a dua that's recited in Qunut as well. Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'amataka allati an'amta alayya. وَعَلَىٰ وَالِدَيَّ وَأَنْ أَعَمَلَ صَالِحًا تَرْضَاهُ O oh Allah, inspire me so that I may thank you for the ni'mah and the bounties that you have blessed me with and you have blessed my parents with and help me act in a way, I act virtuously that you are pleased with me. After this part we say something very interesting and these are the words of the Holy Quran. 
and we say wa aslih li fi dhurriyyati O oh Allah, do islah. Remember, islah is our main theme. It's the goal of Imam al Hussein. He says, reform. We're coming back to reform. And Imam said, reform there. The Quran says, reform here. Wa aslih li fi dhurriyati. O oh Allah, I want reform for myself. But O oh Allah, reform me in my progeny. Aslih li fi dhurriyati. Reform me, give me islah, give me reform in my progeny. What does that mean? That I may be able to attain a certain level of spirituality and success in this life. But oh Allah, not only let my kids reach that level, let them exceed it as well. Let them go beyond it. Oh Allah, as a parent, we have to, we're supposed to pray for our children. This is very important. We cannot move our kids in the right direction without the dua and my dear brothers and sisters especially the parents dua is mustajab Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and especially when it comes to the mother when the mother prays there is special spiritual effects remember yesterday's discussion where Allah has given the responsibility the best and the most valuable profession is motherhood we talked about this yesterday when the mother who has worked so hard day in, day out, when she would stay awake to make sure the kids are sleeping comfortably, when nine months she carries the child, when that mother prays for the child, Allah accepts that prayer very quickly. Allah tells Nabi Musa, O oh Musa, and his mother had just passed away. He says, Musa, from now on, take good care of yourself and pray for yourself. And he says, why? Oh Allah. And he says, up until now your mother was alive. Till the time she was alive, she would pray for you. And because of her prayer, I used to keep away a lot of bala and trials away from you. Now that she has passed away, that dua is not there to protect you. So take extra special care for yourself. Brothers and sisters, <coughs> praying for our children, and praying for reform of our children is the first thing that the parents should do inshallah ta'ala moving forward brothers and sisters we and today's discussion specifically the title that we had thought about was watering the seeds for imam ajallahu ta'ala faraj al sharif allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad and this the seeds here are obviously our children and they are a seed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has bestowed as an amana, as a trust with us. Our responsibility is to nurture them from a seed to a sapling into a tree. But for ourselves, no. They are the servants of the Imam. They are the ones who, if we are not there, they will take up the mission of the Imam and serve him when he reappears. Or if they are not there, their children will. And this is what it means. If we don't make it to the camp of the Imam in our life, and in case we are not from those who will rise from their grave when the Imam reappears, at least we do something that Imam's army, Imam's helpers will be filled. And at least our children will be a part of it. What do we do? What do we do now? We need to water these seeds. And I'll tell you, let's step back a bit. Let's step back. You've probably heard the ahadith that talk about the Akhir zaman You've probably heard the ahadith, the narrations that talk about the social situation that will be prevalent at the time of the Akhir zaman And in this retrospect, assuming that we are in the Akhir zaman and based on these signs, it does look like it may be. And inshallah we pray that it is so that we are closer to the time of the reappearance of our master. Inshallah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, one of the qualities and the primary quality of the social situation at the time of Akhirul Zaman from the Ahadith is that the family unit will be shattered. The family unit will be shattered. Ahadith will do, do say this. Parents don't care what kids are doing. Kids don't care about parents. 
to that extent. I can't go into too much detail. But just to give you an idea, to that extent that the average family unit is where maybe bodies are under one roof, but minds and hearts and spirits are all in different directions. Long story short, to that extent that parents not only not respect, uh, kids, pardon me, don't not only respect the parents, they sometimes verbally abuse their parents, and this is from the hadith, and they even at times pray for the death of their parents. This is from the ahadith. This is what Akhirul Zaman would look like. And my dear brothers and sisters, there are situations where kids are so detached from their parents that some of these dynamics are present in some families, unfortunately. Now this is not only saying that this will be in Muslim families, no. It's just a general outlook on the families across the world and if you take the general feeling in the families in the world, this is happening. For sure it's happening by now. What is our responsibility? First and foremost, and when, when the ahadis talk about this, it's not that this is how we should be doing. No, it's actually warning us and saying, this will be the situation. You take care of yourself. So what is our responsibility? Besides, number one, praying for the parents and for the children. Number two, respect each other in the family the Holy Quran is so specific regarding respect to parents that when it comes to the parents Allah says Anishkur li wa li wa li when you come to thank me don't turn away by just simply saying shukran lillah alhamdulillah no alhamdulillah and say thank you to your parents as well in the same breath Allah is saying he's not even saying Anishkur li wa anishkur li wa li Saying, Anishko li, thank me, wali wali daik, and your parents. In another place where Allah talks about His worship, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعَبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّا Immediately He says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Immediately. Allah is so sensitive about parents and respecting the parents and keeping their status and dignity and honor and maintain it. To that extent that when parents are younger, we're supposed to maintain our respect and obedience to them. But when they become older and physically unfit, and when they cannot exercise that level of authority that they used to over us, at that time the Quran says you as children need to humble yourself more. Surah, is Surah Al-Isra. Surah Bani Israel, in the same verse that I recited, وَبِلْ وَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And the verse continues, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا If one of your parents or both of your parents become older, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفْ Do not even say أُفْ or chide them. وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Do not say anything disrespectful towards them. وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا And say honorable, dignified things to them. In an honorable, dignified manner interact with them. Not only in words, in your actions as well. Should not walk with arrogance with them. وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ Humble your wings. As in your body should also look as if you're humbling yourself before your senior parents. وَقُلْ رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا On one hand, the parents are told to pray for the kids. Here Allah is saying, you kids, pray for your parents. رَبِّ رَحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا Oh Allah, have mercy on them the way they raised me up when I was a little child. Brothers and sisters, Akhirul Zaman has different standards. We have different standards. Respect to parents, we need to keep it first and foremost in our minds and hearts. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, another aspect, and I'll make it short. We've been talking about halal pleasures and halal ways of fulfilling ourselves. This is very important when it comes to building the family unit. Kids need to have fun. 
kids need to have flexibility. And in our workshop with the parents, we did talk about these issues and we even said that at times we as parents are strict on things that even Allah is not strict with us on. For example, we expect our kids to come home from school and pray Salah right away, for example. Yeah. Or we reprimand them and say, why did you not pray at school? Obviously, if it becomes qadha, then they have to pray at school. right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is he reprimanding us if we don't pray at work? And as long as our salah doesn't become qadha, obviously it's not the ideal. Ideally, we endeavor to pray on time wherever we are. But with children, there needs to be a bit more softness. A bit more flexibility. If Allah has given us till sunset time for our salah to get qadha, now this is from a parental perspective obviously. I'm speaking to the parents. Let the children not take this and go home and say, you know what, I'm not going to pray at school. No, inshallah you are praying at school. This is part of your Islamic identity. This will help show people that you are Muslim. It will ward off Islamophobia. This is part of our strategy. At school, my dear younger brothers and sisters, please endeavor to practice as much as possible at school. Your wajibat for sure, but at the same time, it's mustahab to pray salat at awwal time and make sure if you can, obviously if class time is going on, the very first break time that you have, recess or whatever, that's the best time to inshallah try and pray salah. But coming back to the parents, if Allah has given us flexibility to pray till sunset, if the child has come home and if they're not in a state to pray salah, let's not force them right away to pray salat. Let's look at their situation. When kids come home from school, there are many reasons. Some kids might just go pray salah because it's their routine, they pray, alhamdulillah, very, very good. But sometimes kids resist. Yeah? And it's it's possible, right? It's a possibility they had a fight at school. It's a possibility their teacher was not as fair as we would like them to be at school. The child is mentally and emotionally disturbed. Well, the first responsibility of the parents is to fulfill their emotional needs and see where are they coming from. Did they actually even have lunch at school? Some people, some kids actually take their lunch and then bring back the same lunch home. And mommy says, Aaj lunch kyun khaya? Why did you not have lunch today? Well, there was some reason. If a child is not physically nourished as well, not only they will not be able to study properly, they don't have energy to do anything else. And they're just going with the flow, right? Well, these are all needs that as parents we need to keep in mind with our children. Brothers and sisters, we need to give our children the flexibility that Allah has given us. Give them some time to relax and then with love and affection say, My dear, it's time for salah. I hope you'll pray before it gets qala. Very politely, I'm sure kids would not say no because they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They want to have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we present Allah to them in a positive, loving way, it's impossible that the child will not want to connect with this loving Lord of ours. It's impossible. But if we, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, we stand with a stick. It's the beneficent, the merciful, but we're standing with a stick. Ya Allah. He's Arhamur Rahimin. Right? We don't have to, in the name of religion, impose ourselves on our kids. Rather, let us make sure religion is made to appear in a very positive way to our children. And I can challenge you. The fitrah of the child, the inner nature of the child that is looking towards Allah, will automatically pull them towards Him. You don't have to force children. You don't have to make it strict for them rather with love and affection all things are possible inshallah sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad
I think uh, I was hoping to reach a point where I would be able to discuss strategies for the three, seven years, but I might have to leave it for tomorrow's discussion. But one hadith and we move towards Masaib, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, in the same discussion of halal pleasures, this last night we talked about halal income, a day before. And that is another very important principle. And this is primarily the responsibility of the father. As we say in Islam, ideally the finances have to be taken care by the father. Obviously if the mother contributes, there's no problem with it. But whatever income is coming into the family, and it has a direct impact on the spirituality of the children, it has to be from halal sources. That's just a reminder. But there's one hadith that really scares me as a parent. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was sitting with his ashab one day and Rasulullah was looking at some children playing over there. And he started crying. And he said, Wailun li awladi akhir zaman min abaihim. Woe be unto the situation that the children and akhir zaman would be at the hands of their parents. Rasulullah is upset with the situation of children in akhir zaman at the hands of their parents. Why? All parents? All children? No. Rasulullah then continues. The ashab come around and say, Ya Rasulullah, min abaihimul mushrikeen. Their parents who are non Muslim, they are mushrik. He says, No. Min abaihimul mu'mineen. I'm upset with them because of their parents who are mu'mineen. Aren't we from the mu'mineen? Aren't we in Akhir zaman Aren't our children and ourselves possibly related to this hadith? Now listening carefully, Rasulullah, when he said this, min abaihimul mu'mineen, these ashab were surprised. Really? The children of mu'min parents are in such a situation that Rasulullah is upset with them? What happened to them? And here Rasulullah says, لَا يُعَلِّمُونَهُمْ شَيْئًا مِنَ الْفَرَائِضِ They, these parents, do not teach their children anything from the wajibat. From things that are the expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Parents take it lightly when it comes to teaching children about religion. Parents take it lightly. Ah, oh, he will learn, she will learn. When she grows up, she has another few years to become baligh. He has another few years, inshallah, you will be fine. Parents take it lightly when it comes to religious upbringing of children. This hadith is really strong, really severe. And Rasulullah continues and says, وَإِذَا تَعَلَّمُوا أَوْلَادَهُمْ And for example, now this there's one group that do not teach their kids anything about religion. Another group, there is a group that does teach them about religion. But when it comes to action on religion, manauhum. They stop them from practicing religion. In the house, they will say, yes, hijab is wajib, music is haram. We all know it. Everybody knows this. But when it comes to practicing, sometimes the mother says, Beta, I don't want you to wear hijab outside. Don't wear a beard. They'll call you ISIS. What is this? Mana'uhum. They are stopping them from practicing the religion. This is the second category of parents who teach their children about religion, may send them to madrasa, but when it comes to practicing what has been taught at madrasa, we're lacking. What happens then? Rasulullah says, and what is the thing that these parents are happy with? These parents are happy with, as Rasulullah says, وَرَضُوا عَنْهُمْ بِعَرْضٍ يَسِيرٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا with whatever paltry sum, whatever minimum they can get from the pleasures of the dunya. For example, I don't care too much about my child, God forbid. I don't care about my child going to madrasa or knowing religion properly to be able to act in a halal way and stay away from haram. But I will spend a fortune on getting my child through university 
through med school, through whatever professional school, so that my child can earn a good, comfortable living. بِعَرَضٍ يَسِيرٍ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا So that what may happen? He may have a comfortable life. Now, this is something Rasulullah is upset with when we focus only on the dunya and neglect the deen. What is Rasulullah expecting? He is expecting we take the deen and the dunya together. Let them go through med school. Rather, it is wajib in some cases for children to go through med school where a Muslim community is in need of a certain profession to be provided services by another Muslim. It is wajib, and this is from the fiqh masail, that a Muslim community, whatever profession is needed to serve the needs of a Muslim community, it is wajib on, wajib kifai on somebody to go take it up. If a community does not have a doctor, somebody has to go become a doctor. And it applies to all professions, including, and I will say this here, the most important profession in a community is to keep the community on the path of religion. And the most important profession is for somebody, it is wajib kifai, on somebody from the community to go study religion and come back. Gone is the time where we can rely on online lectures for our religious needs. Every community needs one person at least to be proficient in religion, to be able to apply religion for the community in practice. Lectures are there, they inspire us, but how do we actually implement religion then? We need, it's wajib kifayu on every community. And brothers and sisters, it's something that this community also needs to consider for the long term. For the long term, 50 years, 100 years down, if this community is growing and it's a Muslim community for sure, we need somebody to have gone from the youth to go study and come back and serve the community. It's wajib kifai. Brothers and sisters, the hadith continues and this part is the, is the part that shakes me the most. And Rasulullah, after saying all of this, he has a word for these parents. We in our Shia faith really believe in tabarra, right? Tabarra. What does tabarra mean? Tabarra means to disassociate from those who are enemies of Allah, enemies of Rasulullah, enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, enemies of the truth. To disconnect and disassociate. By the way, tabarra does not mean swearing. It does not mean swearing. Tabarra comes from the word bara'a, which means to disassociate. Yeah? Tabarra in Islam does not mean to swear. When we do tabarra from certain individuals in Islam, we mean to say, I have nothing to do with this person and he has nothing to do with me. That means I and him do not share anything in common. That is tabarra. Now listen to these words. These parents, including myself, if I am hopefully, inshallah, we all hope we are not from these parents. But in case, unfortunately, we are, these are the words of Rasulullah. He says, فَأَنَا مِنْهُمْ بَرِي وَهُمْ مِنِّي بُرَآ I am bari from them, I am doing tabarra from these parents and these parents have nothing to do with me. Who is saying this? Rasulullah. Whose shafa'a are we expecting on the Day of Judgment? Who is the ultimate shafi, the interceder? Whose intercession will get us into Jannah? Whatever comes, if our actions are null and void, and the last and final hope is the love for Rasulullah in our hearts, and we present the tears for Imam Hussein and say, Ya Rasulullah, this is what I have, and my actions are like this, Rasulullah, Ana min hum bari wa hum minni bura'a. I am doing tabarra from these kinds of parents who give importance to dunya, but no importance to deen. For their children. It shakes me. It really makes me feel what am I doing as a parent and what are we doing as a community of parents 
for our children. Brothers and sisters, we will be answerable on the day of judgment. One incident from the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, and inshallah we move to Masaib. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, Akhir zaman is upon us. And religious education is the way to go, and madrasa is just a band aid solution. We need to go beyond madrasa. We need to go into setting up Islamic schools and Alhamdulillah, I am so glad to learn that there is now a Shia Islamic school setting up, starting up this very month, Alhamdulillah, Al-Baqir Academy. May Allah give them barakah and give them rahmah and give them the direction of the Ahlul Bayt to move the children of the community forward on the path of the Ahlul Bayt Brothers and sisters, this is one important step, but putting our children in madrasa does not take away the responsibility of the parents off their shoulders. Madrasa has one responsibility. Putting children in Islamic school can complement what happens at home, but it does not replace what happens at home. I cannot think that Islamic academy will be like an Islamic microwave. I put my kids in, ping, the kids come out Muslim. It won't happen. It won't happen. If the, the seeds have not been sown at home, the academy cannot do much more than what we do at home. They will provide the knowledge part. They will give the ta'aleem of Islam. But they will not be able to do the tarbiyah of Islam that the parents at home can do better naturally. Imam al Hussein salam through one incident teaches us, shows us the importance of Islamic education. It's Imam al Hussein, right? He knows the Holy Quran, right? He has children. He sends his children to a teacher of the Quran, a Quran teacher. And the teacher teaches one of the children, we don't know, the hadith doesn't say which of the children of the Imam. But when Imam is brought his child and the child recites Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, just Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, we want a Husseini world, you right? Look at what Imam Hussein does. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam gives that Quran teacher jewels and pearls, his mouthful. A whole heap of jewels and pearls just for teaching the child Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Imam Hussein is leading the way here. And he's showing us religious education is so important that if you were to spend thousands and millions and billions, you have not done the justice with Islamic education. What are we spending? Sometimes parents come to me and say, you know, Islamic school standard is not too high. Public school has a better standard. You know, our kids would suffer. I say, you know what? You don't want to suffer in the hereafter, rather suffer in this life. And you look at the seerah of Imam al Hussein, the spiritual health is more important. A, um, an amount of money spent on putting our kids into an Islamic school is well worth that education compared to spending nothing on putting our children in public school. You will see the results, inshallah. The community will see the results, inshallah ta'ala. But Imam al Hussein has shown us the way. And especially in this case, the emphasis is on the Quran. Brothers and sisters, Quran, Quran, Quran. There's another hadith, it's beautiful. It says, when issues and problems and bala and afflictions come upon you, as if a dark night sets upon you. I'm sure you've been camping in a very dark night up on the mountains or in in the prairies somewhere where it's pitch dark or maybe six night six months night north of the arctic right at times you can't see anything imam says when bala and afflictions come upon you like a pitch dark black night alaykum bil quran you have a responsibility to turn towards the quran 
for yourself, for your family, for teaching your children, not only qira'ah and recitation, but appreciating the Holy Qur'an, learning the meaning and the words of the Holy Qur'an. Brothers and sisters, unfortunately, I had quite a few things to mention, but coming back to Islamic education, we don't want to be in this situation where Imam al Hussein says, you cried for me, but you did not pay attention to your children's upbringing. And we say, Inni silmun liman salakum, salamakum. Oh Imam, I am in peace with the one who is in peace with you. Waharbun liman harabakum. I want to be in sync with you. And therefore I make a promise to you, O oh Imam. I will take the children and their religious upbringing from now on very seriously. Let's make a promise. Brothers and sisters, this promise that we're making to Abu Abdullah al Hussein will show up later in such a way that we will not even expect it. The result of this would be, inshallah, that our children will be prepared for the coming of the 12th Imam. Inshallah ta'ala. We find children's education is so important that Imam al Hussein when his brother Imam al Hassan passes away is martyred. He goes towards his brother Imam al Hassan who has been poisoned by his own wife. And this is the mazlumiyah of Imam al Hassan. This is a very mazlum Imam, my dear brothers and sisters. Where in a family unit you would expect sukoon and peace. This Imam does not get that sukoon in his family. He is poisoned by his own wife. Jorda bint Ash'ath. Imam al Hassan has children who are newborn, who are very young. He has four sons who are present in Karbala. Hassan ibn al-Hassan, Abu Bakr ibn al-Hassan, Abdullah ibn Hassan, and Qasim ibn al-Hassan. Four sons. One of them, later on, they realize that he's still alive and he's called Hassan al-Muthanna, Hassan ibn al-Hassan. And then he is saved and then through him the Hassanis today exist. The Hassani Sayyids are children and the Zurriya of Hassan al-Muthanna. But the other three sons, actually all four of them are, they all fight in the battle. But when Hassan ibn al-Hassan is placed with the martyrs at Shami Gariba, when they come to sever the heads of the martyrs and to put them on spears, they find that Hassan al-Muthanna is still alive. So his uncle from his mother's side saves him and takes him to Kufa. And then he um, treats his injuries and he sends them to Medina when he is better. But three other sons of Imam al-Hassan, it is like a promise that Imam al Hassan made to Imam al Hussein. When Imam al Hussein comes to his brother Hassan and he sees him in the state that the poison has gone through his body and now his liver is disintegrating into pieces because of the high level and dosage of the poison, that now that Imam vomits, the pieces of his liver come out into that pan that's in front of him. Imam al Hussein, when he sees the state of his brother, his heart wrenches and he starts crying. When he starts crying, his brother Hassan salam also starts crying and says, Oh brother, you are crying for me, but la yawm ka yawmika ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like the day of yours, oh Aba Abdullah. What is this day like? Let's look at the day of Karbala. Let's look at the day of Ashura on the plains of Karbala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he has three, four sons of Imam al Hassan that he has raised as a father to them. He's been a father to these boys Hassan, Abdullah, Abu Bakr, and Qasim. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he sees that one after the other, the Banu Hashim have now started to go towards the battlefield. They have been now been martyred one after the other. Qasim ibn al Hassan is seeing the coming and going and the martyrdom of all of his cousins now. He says to his mother, Oh mother, shall I go to my uncle and seek permission? Whenever I go, 
he looks at me and he cries and he turns me away. He says, no, you are my brother's son. I can't let you go, Qasim. He says, Qasim, go. I will not give you permission. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he is sitting, suddenly Qasim enters upon him. He starts to jump on his hands and he starts kissing his hands. He jumps to his feet and starts kissing his feet. And he says, Uncle, please give me permission to go to the battlefield. Abu Abdullah al Hussein has no choice at the time. And then he says, Go, my son, Hassan. Go to the battlefield. What do the historians say? Who is Qasim? Qasim is a child who is not even Baligh yet. They say he was 12 years old. And he was so handsome, his face glue like the moonlight. He was so beautiful. When he was put on the, on the horse, on the saddle, Historians say that his feet were not even touching the foot strap where you would put the feet. He was so young. When he goes towards the battlefield, Imam al Hussein bids him farewell and the tears roll down his face. Imam al, Hassan al, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam hugs Qasim before putting him onto the saddle. They cry so much that they both faint and they fall onto the ground. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam bids farewell to Qasim. Qasim goes off into the battlefield as he goes and he starts to remind people in Tankuruni. If you deny me and my rights, for I am the son of Hassan. This is Hussein who has been imprisoned by these people and the, the bala and the trials. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is watching Qasim. Qasim is battling the enemies of Allah. Here, Qasim ibn al Hassan kills many. Some say he kills 35 from the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qasim's face is now so beautiful that one of the enemies of Allah sees and he says, My, By God, I would be at a loss if I were to be defeated by this child. He says, I would love to now go and strike on this child and kill him. He comes out, his name is Amr ibn Sa'ad, Amr ibn Sa'ad al-Azdi, he takes his sword, he comes running towards Qasim, from a direction he doesn't realize, he strikes him on his head, Qasim falls to the ground, he calls out to his uncle Aba Abdullah, Ya Amma, oh my uncle, come to my help, Imam al Hussein is watching Qasim, him. He runs like an eagle. There's no place in the maqtal where it says Imam would go towards the maqtal with such speed. But when Qasim calls out, Imam al Hussein ran like, as the maqtal says, like an eagle perches down on its prey. Imam was running towards the battlefield. When the enemy see Imam come with such speed, there is panic in the army of Yazid. When they see this, they start to move in any direction suddenly there is trampling of the bodies Imam al Hussein arrives at Qasim's head side and when he sees the situation he says it is difficult it is indeed difficult for your uncle to see that you call to him and he does not respond and when you call out and he does respond this is the state that he sees your body in Imam Imam al Hussein takes Qasim, he puts his chest on his chest and he takes him towards the tents. There, Imam al Hussein puts Qasim with the other shahada. But this is not the last one. This is not the last son of Hassan to be martyred in the plains of Karbala. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when Ali and al Asghar has been martyred, he is heading towards the battlefield. He goes towards the battlefield and he is now in a position where there is no more energy left in his body 
Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam is on the ground. There is a shadow coming over him. A person is coming with a dagger towards him. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, he does not see that person, but there's a child standing at the tent door. Abdullah ibn Hassan, when he sees Imam Al Hussein is going to be attacked by a sword, he runs towards his uncle Imam Al Hussein. He puts his hands in the the way of the sword, the sword which was coming down on Imam Hussein, severs the hands of Abdullah ibn Hassan. Abdullah's hands hang by the skin. Imam al Hussein, when he realizes that he grabs him, takes him in his arms, and he says, Oh, the son of my brother, be patient, for Allah will join you with your father. Allah la'anatullah al qawmi al-zalimin. سيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلب